It's time for us to do something. Na, 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 na. G'day and welcome to this special episode of Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello and today I'm joined with the host of Vision Radio's program 2020, Neil Johnson. Neil, thank you so much for coming along. Well, thank you for the invitation, Dave. Now, uh, you've actually had me on your show a number of times, so it's well overdue uh, that I returned the favour. Um, but I actually think you're genuinely uh, an interesting story that my viewers will will uh, get a lot of uh, excitement out of getting to know. Your story is varied um, and adventurous. You've gone from becoming uh, gone from being a, a church pastor to becoming uh, a, a very widely broadcast uh, radio host and, and interviewer right across um, Australia Care of Vision Radio. For those of you that don't know, Vision Radio is broadcast by satellite into uh, every town in Australia, uh, or at least a, a rapidly expanding number of towns. Uh, what percentage might, of the population might you reach? Well, uh, as we look at statistics, uh, around about a third of the population. Okay. But we're into 700 plus cities, towns and communities all over Australia. So the whole and, uh, of Australia is a bit of an overstatement. It's a little bit of an overstatement. The but work is still yet to do. 700 towns is a yes. lot. There's an awful lot of towns. Yeah. Wonderful when you have opportunity to interact with people from those towns and you mm. come across names and you think, I hope I'm pronouncing this right because, <laughs> uh, you know, and everyone wants to hear their town name pronounced right. <laughs> and it's not always so easy to do, but I've been doing this a long time now, so I get to be a little bit better at this each year when we come around to, you know, talking to people and yeah. talking about the towns they come from. But one of the things that Vision... Well, you know, that's, that's radio broadcast. Of course, if, if we allow for the fact that people can tune in via the app and the internet, it really is uh, all of Australia. But uh, just spend 30 seconds. How much does it cost for a town who wants Christian radio on a local frequency that they can listen to in their car? Well, uh, you talk to our technical department and our finance department to actually get real figures. But if there is an available license and there is that level of support in the community that says, we want Christian radio for our town, uh, the opportunity is there. And if you're putting dollar figures on it, and maybe my figure's a little outdated, but around about that $5,000 mark yeah. gets into a town with a low-powered transmitter that receives a signal from a satellite and rebroadcasts it to a small country town. Yeah. Now, obviously you get bigger powered licenses and that runs into an extra few dollars, yeah. uh, but and that's not always available that, because if it was, we is, would grab it. That is a super achievable uh, amount of money for most small towns, uh, the Christians to get together and, and make that happen so that they can have non-stop free Christian radio without having to set up all the infrastructure in their town. Well, if you can have Christian radio ministry uh, 24-7, 365 days a year, and you could have it at such a low price, that becomes a real bargain. Yeah. So when word gets out that there is a frequency that's available, and there's someone in that town that wants that frequency, yeah. then opportunities happen, doors open, and people are able to get Christian radio for their town. And so you think, well, this is a ministry that I can pursue to bring the gospel 24-7, 365 days a year into my town. So yeah. people snap up the opportunity. And when it's able to happen, we're all for making it happen. And how long ago did Vision Radio start with its first station and its first license? Well, we're only just over 20 years now. The very first station that came on air was in Bow Desert in Queensland. Right. And uh, since then, there's been this growth that's happened. And, you know, celebration that would have happened along the way at a, a hundred stations on the air, you might think, wow, that is just an amazing achievement. But then yeah. 200, 300, yeah. 400, 500, 600, and then like 700 plus. In actual fact, 740 is closer to the figure of the number of broad broadcast sites that we have around the country. So yeah. all that in 20 years, you've got to say that is absolutely astounding growth. Yeah. And because it's not government funded, you've got to be able to say that listeners and supporters yeah. of Vision Christian Media have been very generous. And, you know, when they give to the ministry, uh, they keep coming back and they continue to give. And they realise that there's an operational budget and there's 
also the opportunity to expand. And yep. even as we're talking now, there is a vision to have another 100 sites on the air over the next three years. Brilliant. Exciting days ahead. Yeah. And, and the reason this is relevant to my audience, which includes non-Christians, uh, is because we were talking just before we sat down uh, about the, the problems we're debating in society at the moment. Essentially, you know, there's people who want to misdiagnose them for political opportunism, but it's a cultural problem. There's an endemic cultural problem and a, an abandonment of good traditional values which have stood us well over, over the test of time. Uh, and so for there to be a replacement and dilution of the negative media that's available universally, uh, that is a great thing for a town to have an alternative to listen to that's always positive, always focused on truth, and still, as your show says, not afraid to, to actually talk about the issues that everybody is talking about. Well, I have this wonderful privilege of being able to talk about these sorts of issues. And typically when people think of Christian media and Christian radio in particular, they're thinking of, well, here's another half hour program of someone who's standing up in front of their congregation. They recorded this years ago and here we are replaying it. And it might be an absolutely fabulous message, but sometimes it's got an American voice. Uh, sometimes it's about a wonderful biblical topic, unpacking some incredible scripture, but oftentimes it doesn't relate to where that rubber hits the road mm -hmm. and the issues that people are facing today. And so what we try to do, and you know, honour to the people who put me in the seat in the first place, uh, who were not afraid to take a risk and said, well, why don't we try and engage with the issues of where people are at? Why yeah. don't we try and bring a biblical Christian foundation to the sorts of issues that people are thinking about today because people who are in church life actually are looking for and are interested so in and in fact are excited about yep. substance yep. to their faith. Yep. And we want to say a biblical foundation. We want to point people to how they might be able to find answers and how these sorts of issues relate to them because understanding God and his wisdom that comes through his word is going to have an amazing impact on people's maturity. So yeah. people get exposed to these things. I get people say to me, Dave, I never even knew there were the number of topics that we could talk about. And so I like to get into really any topic. No topic really is off limits. Mm. So we get, into, we get into sex, drugs, Rock and roll, you know, all of those sorts of things. People are people are into <laughs> rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, every now and then I do a program on music. Uh, sometimes on worship music, and sometimes it's on, you know, where the foundations of our music are and the sorts of influences yeah. they have on people's lives. But to your point, one of my frustrations previously, without mentioning any names, is is radio stations that say, "Oh, we don't go near anything political. We're we're apolitical." Uh, and and I, I respect why they want to do that, um, but I, I just think it's poorly executed. And I think you guys tackle it in a very way, sensible way. That's that's balanced uh, and non-partisan, not dividing your audience. You know, dignifying that everybody's coming with with a perspective and a reason for holding um, whatever ideas they do. So you're not patronising um, to your audience. Who are some of the most rewarding interviews um, that you've done. How many interviews have you done? How many guests have you had? Have you counted, got a tally? No, lost count. Um, lost count. Basically, it comes down to around about 15 a week. And this wow. is the 12th year of uh, 2020. Okay. So, uh, so you could do the sums yourself and uh, work out that in your mind. Uh, I do have a little bit of time off in the year when I'm having a holiday or something like so that. So it's but... about 600 a year <laughs> if there was 40, only 40 weeks. Um, so six thousand over seven, maybe approaching seven to ten thousand. Yeah, I think I've done the apprenticeship. And now we're getting into, you know, what it all means. And So what tips do you have for me as an interviewer <laughs> without, without any, uh, you know, false praise? You know, a lot depends on the introduction. I always say don't skimp on the introduction 
then you've got the body of the material that grows, a little bit like you might think of I'm writing a, a great story or I'm reading or writing a good book. And then you've got what happens at the end of the interview. In other words, where do I go from here? And I always like to give listeners an opportunity to go to a place where they can score more information. Where yeah. can I find a better resource? When I can find out more about that person who was the guest, uh, that's what I'm about. And in some sense, it's a little bit like being the person who uh, is the servant of the guest, a servant of the listener, a servant of the radio ministry that helps to be the go-between that brings out the best so that equips the guest. And, you know, you might even think of those scriptures out of Ephesians chapter 4. You know, what are all of these gifts to the church all about? Mm. You know, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints yes, that's to right. do the work of the ministry. Brilliant. And so being informed... It's not all about you. It's not all about me. In mm. fact, uh, you know, in fact, uh, while I've got opinions and the opinions do come out, you know, quite loudly in the conversations that I'm a part of, my opinions are about sparking in the mind of the guest uh, what their opinions and what their convictions might hold. Yeah. And what I do love about the idea that, that Christians can have opinions, because we might all have an opinion and we might air it around the dinner table, but when our opinions grow into convictions, we're getting a little bit closer. Because even though we right. might be a person who has a, an opinion and then even a conviction, Somehow or other, unless that conviction becomes action, then we might not do anything with it and it may not be any use to us at all. It may not be any use in the kingdom. The kingdom of God, of course, uh, is what we're all a part of. And uh, if we're playing the game in the kingdom, if we're participating in what God is doing in his purpose, uh, then those convictions have to convert into actions yep. for us to actually be involved and do something worthwhile. Uh, yeah, useless Christianity. God doesn't need us to warm a seat on Sunday. He actually needs us to be partners in what he's trying to do in the earth. Well, that, that's his desire. And even if it is uh, mum and dad around the dinner table and they've got two or three kids, uh, some of those are teenagers, the conversations that you're having are as much important when it comes to a leadership role as what it might be for say someone like you Dave who's mm. you know got a public profile or someone like me with a bit more of a public profile and we're looking to introduce people to opinions that might grow into convictions and then action but for mum and dad around the table our first responsibility might be our family and we don't want parents to suffer by having their children not be well enough equipped to be able to face you know, the blowtorch that right. will come on them as yeah. they're going into their older school years and into university. I mean, there are challenging times. We're in the middle of a cultural revolution. Yeah. Uh, so parents need to be equipped as much as anyone. But yeah. to, you know, for people who are serving in church, department leaders, sometimes we think of the leader of the church as being the pastor uh, or the assistant pastor. But there are people who lead the youth ministry and the children's ministry mm. and the welfare ministry that reaches out to people in the wider community. All of these people need to have substance that continues to equip them so that when yeah. they're serving God, they're doing so with confidence, yeah. uh, knowing that what they are actually talking about and doing is true and authentic. Uh, but a lot of that comes just because we're listening to and absorbing and like reading our Bible, the foundation, perhaps having time with God. But then when you've got access to 24-7 Christian media, that actually is a huge contribution to people's maturity in their faith. Yeah. What are two or three of the best interviews, stories, uh, conversations that stand out in your mind over seven to 10,000? Well, out of all those, uh, you know, the one that comes to mind, I can't even remember the name of the two ladies that I had in this conversation. Okay. <laughs> but you'd be able to Google them because they were two Iranian ladies and they had written a book and they had come to Australia and they were promoting their book. Now, the reason why they were important is because these were two ordinary ladies, you might say, living in Tehran in Iran Mm -hmm. And they took it upon themselves to fill their backpacks and under the cover of darkness every night go into the streets of Tehran delivering gospel pamphlets, booklets and Bibles. 
rain, hail, shine, wow. or snow, uh, they did this every night. That's not just a, a hobby, that's a, a mission they were on. They were on a mission. Yeah. So much success to their mission that apparently authorities in Tehran thought there was a major campaign that was undermining the Islamic leadership the regime, and yeah. it was operating and getting these Bibles into people's care. So eventually these ladies were arrested. Now arrested, thrown into Evan prison in Tehran and were convicted and sentenced to death. Now it just so happens that you know death, the death penalty in Iran, they do have that and you are uh, able to be executed. Well, their case went on long enough so that eventually uh, some international pressure uh, uh, causes the Iranian authorities to try and save face and they were eventually released. Wow. When they were released, they fled across the border uh, out of Iran. Eventually they wrote a book together and now they were promoting it around the world. So this is very interesting because I've had a long radio career and I've spoken to and met lots of celebrities. Mm. You know, I've met lots of great <coughs> celebrities and sometimes big names. I've been on the radio now for around about 40 years. Really? And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't look that old, do I? But <laughs> the time goes by. Well, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, radio, uh, ministry training, church leadership, back on the radio. But radio is the primary career. Right. So I've met lots of I celebrities. I confess I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well... Uh, when it came to these two ladies... I've probably only known you since your church leadership days. Okay. Uh, and, and to my embarrassment, I haven't asked what you did before that. Right, I did lots of other I radio I just assumed you were that. always a pastor. Commercial radio uh, is where I started as a 16-year-old. And uh, out in western Queensland, okay. uh, then to... Uh, so places like Longreach and Emerald, and then to the Gold Coast, where I was the night announcer at the now very famous, iconic 4GG uh, on the Gold Coast. And I was in that role for about five years, uh, wow. announcing and into news, and then I went off to Bible college. Right. Anyway, let me finish this story. Yeah. Because I met lots and lots of celebrities in the hallways of that, particularly that radio station 4GG. Mm. So I was used to celebrities and... As you do, you start to admire celebrities and you think because you've met someone who's well-known that you think that's important and you feel good about yourself. Yep. And you know, I had one of those moments where the penny drops. When I was talking to these two women from Iran, they were on death row. They were sentenced to be executed. And I realised that as a Christian believer, I've got my celebrity all the wrong way around. Mm. You know, I, uh, I've met lots of, uh, you know, movie stars, rock stars, pop stars, but meet some people who were on death row who were sentenced to be executed because they're faithful Christian believers. Mm. And you realise that those other celebrities pale into insignificance mm. because when you've got some people who have been on death row and they are now here glorifying God who has delivered them from. I mean, you can think of Daniel. You can think of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They've got their own story of being delivered from execution. Mm. And here they are sitting before you and you recognize that God has his hand so powerfully upon people. So we have this celebrity thing all up the wrong way. Let's get celebrities for people who have suffered for their faith. That's why I love the persecuted church. Mm. I'm an advocate for the persecuted church. Yeah, likewise. Had a wonderful experience of going it's to very the... instructive for us. It's it's something that we're completely oblivious to until we study uh, and hear testimonies uh, about the 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 persecuted church. Uh, we we're, we're so comfortable and prosperous and luxurious in our relative freedom uh, that that we fail to just value how precious that freedom is, how precious the gospel is, the scriptures uh, and, and our faith, um, that people would willingly shed their blood, lose their lives and, and liberty for, for that freedom and for that, for that gospel. I had the most wonderful and I might say humbling privilege to go to the Middle East 
with wow. the organisation called Open Doors. Yeah. Now, Open Doors is one our, of the... Our ministry supports Open Doors every month. One of the primary advocates for people who are in the persecuted church. And when you appreciate that mm. there are more than 300 million people who are Christian believers who are in high-risk settings around the world uh, under persecution, uh, you recognise the work of an organisation like that. So I had this wonderful privilege, and two weeks I spent... This was at a time when ISIS had come to the fore and I went to Lebanon with Open Doors uh, and spent a couple of days actually on the border uh, between Lebanon and Syria. And at the time, uh, in the valley where we were, uh, there were as many as 800,000 refugees who had streamed across the border. Yeah. And there were the partners of Open Doors uh, not being judgmental as to who's a Christian and who's a Muslim, just recognising that these people found themselves in incredible need and doing all that they could to support. And all that they could, probably a drop in the bucket uh, mm. compared to what was needed, but all that they could to do right. in supporting people who were coming across in absolute distress, refugees fleeing Syria. And they weren't just fleeing ISIS, they were fleeing the civil war that was going on. Yep. in Syria. That still goes on today. Mm. But a wonderful privilege. And in all of that, to be able to sit in the tents of refugees and to experience their hospitality, you know, they're smiling, uh, they're offering you their food. Yep. When you recognise just how hard it is for them to even find food, to be able to find work that can sustain a family, uh, you recognise that you know there is a need for Christian organisations to be advocates mm. for the persecuted church and in the way that they do, generously reaching out to people, whether they be Christian or Muslim in that setting. Yeah. Uh, one other prominent uh, interview that you've done, which stands out in your mind and, and seen it's such a long career, feel free to, to go before even the uh, 12 years at Vision. Uh, well, stay with the ones in vision because, uh, you know, if we talk about, you know, people who were persecuted or on death row and uh, you're talking about an opposite to the usual way we think about celebrity, well, there are some wonderful Christian thinkers around the world. And in a day of modern technology, we can send an email and set up an interview with some of the best people. Yeah. And there is one particular name that comes to mind. His name is Vishal Mangalwadi. Mm -hmm. He's known to be the Indian version of a C.S. Lewis. Wow. And I might just say that uh, I did have Vishal in the studio with me. And uh, from time to time, I've contacted him and we've done some interviews from his place. Uh, he's in America at the moment, but uh, he's an Indian. And he is a wonderful thinker about where we have come to in Western civilization and where we've come from. And of course, if you read his books, and he is a prolific author, at the moment he's in the middle of a major series that develops the narrative that goes on from his book, you know, the book that made your world, you know, how the Bible shaped Western civilization. Mm. And once you start to see, and, and it's interesting because an Indian perspective, because you might say, well, he's outside of the bubble. Yep. He's outside of the fishbowl looking in and he can see... Not a Westerner. He's not a Westerner. In mm -hmm. fact, he thinks as an Easterner, but understands the West. And so I have loved conversations with him. Brilliant perspective. So when we talk about the sorts of issues that might shape me along the way, uh, I think of doing interviews with people like that and being absolutely astounded at tremendous wisdom. Mm. Uh, wisdom like, you know, where do we get our definition of father from? And we can trace that back to having a father God yeah. and the image of father that we have in the Bible. Where do we get our understanding of human rights from? Human rights is a Christian thing. So when people are fighting for their human rights, they're actually fighting with their Christian foundation, yep. even though some of them might be actually anti-Christian. So yeah. wonderful things that give us foundation to our faith. So wonderful people like that who are, uh, you would call them philosophers. And yes, you do have to, as I say, lean in a little closer to the radio so you don't miss the finer points because we're not afraid to get a bit deeper than than just the shallow yeah, it's brilliant. areas. Yep. Um, now, 
you're not just a, a radio presenter. You're also studying your master's in Christian leadership at the moment, is it? Is that the right course name? Well, I finished it uh, a couple of years ago, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a congratulations. <laughs> it's a master's degree in ministry leadership. Right now, that's interesting because uh, it is such a wonderful topic to study. And I've met people who've studied leadership, and they said absolutely waste of time. But if you are in a ministry leadership role, and you have an opportunity to dig deep, uh, there are wonderful treasures to be found. The interesting and powerful thing about leadership is that there are 70,000 leadership books that would be on the market, mm. 70,000. And that might even be an underestimate, but in 70,000 books on leadership, none of them agree with each other. It's usually people who've got their own story to tell. Mm. Uh, they'll adopt uh, those sorts of principles and foundations that others have written about and they'll, in, they'll in, enlarge on those. But what I found uh, in studying ministry leadership, and I had a goal in mind too, I thought I want my studies to contribute to a way that I might think about leadership that might even eventually turn into a book. And uh, I have a book written, it's not published yet. How's that going, I was going to say? <laughs> it's, uh, it, I tell you, anyone who's written a book knows that uh, there's a lot of work in it. Uh, I'm at the point where I'm proofreading it for the probably the 12th time okay. <laughs> and I've got some uh, some more work to do on that but hopefully this year that book will be out. Are you speaking to a publisher yet? I've spoken to some publishers but I haven't let them have my book yet okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder whether I will need to uh, approach a publisher or whether I will self-publish. Yeah. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity that I, I assume that I'll have uh, in that Vision Christian Media has its own distribution yeah, outlet, and that's a Vision Christian Store. Yeah. So we're broadcasting all over Australia, and Vision Christian Store becomes a resource outlet for all sorts of wonderful Bible teaching mm. and books from the sorts of teachers that we present on the radio. And so we might assume that uh, that my book will be available. They might be willing to affiliate with you publicly. But you know what? <laughs> uh, but in, in uh, you know in Vision's honor and favor, vision scrutinizes everything. And uh, if it's not in accordance with the overall ethos, uh, they're not afraid to say no. So, uh, so I'll, I'll need to get a final tick on that, but I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be... And what web address can people go to to access the Vision Store? Well, Vision Store is vision.org.au and you'll find links there to the store. And whether it's the radio broadcast that you can stream or whether it's the youth channel, Vision 180, uh, whether it's getting a hold of the Word for Today devotional, which is the most widely read devotional in Australia. Right. And uh, wonderful resources in all of that. That and is uh, very universal and Vision publishes that. Vision publishes it. Brilliant. And, uh, you know, as many as 140,000 every quarter. And correct me if I'm wrong, I believe people can actually go to the Vision website and ask for that to be mailed to them every quarter? Quarterly. For free. Free of charge. Donations invited, but not No strings necessary. attached. Yeah. People who find that the word for today is useful to them, and I must say it's an easy to read devotional. There's mm. a passage of scripture. There's some commentary in a short half page uh, devotional. Mm. And then there's an option there you can read more deeply in what we call soul food and which will take you through the reading of the Bible in a year. Brilliant. And when people get a hold of it, it's a little bit addictive. And I'm not, a, not ashamed to say that. It's a little bit addictive. In fact, I read the Word for the Day weekdays. I don't read it on weekends, but of course you can read it every day if you want. <laughs> but I read it weekdays. And that for me is the spark of a daily devotion. And Brilliant. I'll spend time in prayer after that. But interesting thoughts around a verse and passage of scripture, yep. which are very, very useful. And when people do discover that this is something that they love, uh, then people will often be generous in the way that they might make a donation. Yeah, but there's no, there's no obligation there. I people love can that. get it for free. So what's your book about? What's, what's the story about leadership that you think uh, you've got to, to offer the world? Well, the title 
is likely to be, and I can't say I've confirmed it because, uh, hey, you never know, I might change my mind at the last minute. You're allowed to do that but until it's, it's in print. All right, it's called uh, Public Christians in a Secular Age. Now, my inspiration for well, that... Well, that's a very relevant topic for, for this channel and, and certainly your ministry. And, you know, it's not going to be light reading, and uh, I'll be warning people uh, that it isn't light reading. Uh, neither will it be a book that will date easily. Uh, the essence of it is because we can really quite easily identify that we're moving into a time of very much a secularized state. And we can identify that the church is very much marginalized in a secularized state. So the book largely, I think if you take an overall view of that, is about how a season can change. And uh, I've introduced some thinking in there that I call, and uh, you know, maybe it's not as deep as it could be yet, but it's, I've called it winter spring theory. The idea that when a secularized state begins to rule a nation and begins to marginalize the church, you've got a little bit of an image, something a bit like C.S. Lewis in the Narnia Chronicles. And a lot of people are familiar with that imagery where the white witch uh, has a state of winter across the land of Narnia. Mm. And when we look at that story of the, the, the Narnia Chronicles, uh, Aslan the Lion, uh, who is representative of Jesus. Well, when Aslan roars, the winter is rolled back and new growth appears. So in the way that I've been thinking about leadership in all of that, because when I say public Christians, I'm talking about people who are not only Christian leaders, uh, but also business leaders, anyone who would see themselves in a public role and they want to be mm -hmm. named as a Christian. Well, what do you have to know? What do you have to do to be a little bit like the one who represents the roar of the lion, Aslan, that sees the winter chill rolled back? So when we talk about the, the way that the ice might freeze over in a nation under a secular state, which is one dimensional, I might say. Secularism is one dimensional because it's morphed into such a way uh, that secularism's become almost a weapon to attack the church with. You know, and as you know, Dave, you know, the church and state summit. Uh, people say there's a separation between church and state. Well, the idea that the state overtakes the church is not a good one. And that doesn't bode well for the wider society. The health of our society is going to mean that there are going to be Christians who have to be able to Dis display their faith in such a way that the winter chill is rolled back and the warmth and the growth of spring returns. Can you think so of some examples of that in, in our generation? Okay, well, let me or just... Or even current. Yeah, well, let, me, let me just say, uh, I, I, I do tackle the idea. There's a little bit of philosophy and there's a little bit of history and then there's a little bit of strategic planning in this book. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I ask the question, was there ever a golden age of Christian media in Australia? Because as we said at the beginning of this conversation, well, Christian media really is fairly young as it is with Vision Radio. It's been around, there's been a few capital city broadcasters uh, over the decades. Mm. But there was a golden age back in the 1950s. And in the 1950s, you had the I word of... I remember it well. Oh, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> this is before my time. But, uh, you know, I started to kick in in the 1960s and 70s. But, but back in the 1950s, there was an overlap. And in the overlap of the written word being very highly regarded, people regarded the Bible, Australia was a very Christianized society. People went to church, people acknowledged God, people lived their lives according to a Christian ethic. And that was taken for granted. Mm -hmm. The rise of broadcasting was coming to the fore in the 1950s. And on the broadcasting, you had Christian content. So you had some wonderful pioneers who were in Christian radio or on secular radio as it was at the time, state radio, commercial radio, but they all had some regulations where they had to have a certain amount of religious broadcast material. And they were well listened to. 
and radio stations would play hymns and uh, they would do all sorts of incredible things that we would almost say, that doesn't sound like Christian radio, it doesn't even sound like you know what commercial radio would be like or the ABC, the national broadcaster. But in this overlap, there was like a crescendo that hit Australia. And in the 1950s, the Bible was held in high esteem and mass media was in favour of those Christian ethics that were coming through the Bible. And in 1950s, we could almost say that was a golden age for Christianity, mm. a golden age for Christian radio in Australia. And the proof of that is in the culmination of the 1950s, because in 1959, Billy Graham came to Australia and people describe this as the closest that we have ever been to national revival. Mm. And when the word of God is held in high esteem, when there is publicity to the word of God, when there are people who are unashamed, you have the evangelist arrive and uh, you have tens of thousands coming to Christ and what is described as closest thing to national revival in Australia. So then we see the 1960s kick in, mm. the emergence of new mass media, the change of season the is upon us. The beginning of the culture war. The culture war is beginning to develop and so itself in the west you know you've got uh, the rebellion of the 1960s and the 1970s and the way that those things have developed sometimes uh, we can describe these sorts of things as a little bit like a cultural eclipse uh, an eclipse when you think of the eclipse of the sun the moon shadow or the moon comes in front of the sun and blocks out the sun and uh, there's a sort of uh, concept uh, that comes from a wonderful, and I'll just mention a, a philosopher, Charles Taylor, who has Catholic foundations, but has written the most uh, emphatic and defining book on the secular age. And uh, he talks about this sort of uh, eclipse that happens. And of course, if an eclipse can happen one way, that secularism might block out the light of God, then we ought not to be afraid of thinking that there is another eclipse can happen, whereas we can bring the light of God back into our society. Mm. And so there's a lot of different thoughts in all of that. Uh, but this is the sort of thing that I've been grappling with, that I've been writing about, uh, that part of my master's degree, uh, you know, when you write a dissertation uh, at the end of your master's, you you're into a research topic and you've gone through a whole lot of different topics beforehand, including how to write academically. And so you, you have this ability now to put your thoughts on paper. And I encourage people to do some higher level of study because the confidence that it gives you when you get that little bit of paper at the end of it, which doesn't technically mean much, but along with that piece of paper, that you call a degree is this level of confidence that comes upon you to be able to put your thoughts on paper or to be able to present your thoughts and have confidence that they hold weight just like the other thoughts that are in the marketplace. Yeah, that's, um, that's yeah, provoking, provoking analogies and, and metaphors there. Um, do you hold a rational hope for the spring? Well, I do because there is something special that happens when the church is under pressure. It's true. We think of, if you think of it a little bit like a, a sporting field, and you've got Christians and non-Christians on the sporting field. And the non-Christians all of a sudden think, why don't we shovel those Christians off to the sidelines? And so when we think about you know, Christian faith being marginalized, you might think of it a little bit like being pushed off to the sidelines. But those who pushed us off to the sidelines feel a sense of their own victory and feel as though we have defeated the foe. The Christians are now silenced. But what's happening while the Christians are in their marginalized state is that the pressure is growing. People are thinking critically. They're wondering what happened. They say, how did we lose our place on the field? Mm. And what happens is, uh, as the pressure grows and opportunities come, and as people are in prayer and believing for deliverance from God, I mean, this is a little bit like being thrust into 
you know, a little bit like the Israelites, uh, you know, sent off to Babylon. Uh, mm. they're, they're, you know, they're, uh, they're, they are often another country. It's, it's a strange place. Yeah. Uh, we used to have influence. We don't have influence anymore. And so the pressure is on. Uh, people are on their knees. They're expecting deliverance from God. And the idea of republicization of our Christian faith is always going to be at the center of where we think we should be going. We ought never be pessimistic about the future. We should be optimistic about the future. Do you remember when uh, Elijah had defeated the prophets of Baal and he fled because uh, Ahab and his very nasty wife were pursuing him? And he was in a state of depression, Mm. feeling like he's just seen the hand of God. Now he's got uh, we've got to Ahab and Jezebel wanting his blood. So he's out in the middle of the wilderness, absolutely depressed. But he hears from God. And the encouragement is that there are 7,000 more mm. who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Yep. And so that has to be an encouragement to us that while we're on the sidelines, while we're feeling marginalized, and by the way, I don't think we're completely marginalized yet. I think we're in the battle And we need to see a few more critically thinking Christians and plenty more on their knees, recognizing that there are some things that we need to do now to engage with our culture. But we ought never assume that we're only on our own, that Mm. there are thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands perhaps, uh, who are ready to stand and to bring this republicization to light. Brilliant. What are some of the topics, just as we wrap up, what are some of the topics that you've got planned uh, in, uh, this is obviously pre-recorded, so some of these topics by the time this video is shown will be recently published, um, but what are some of the topics you've got planned coming up in 2020? Well, as in the program, not the year. (laughs) 2020 works like this. Uh, We have a series of regular commentators. That means that at any point in time, we're ready to tackle the stories as they come to light. Mm -hmm. So I have some wonderful regulars. I do something regularly with the Australian Christian Lobby. I do something regularly on the breaking news that comes out of Israel. Because if Israel are the people of God, and we'd say, yes, they are still God's chosen people, then what happens in Israel affects the Christian believer. So we we, we tackle those. Uh, We tackle finance issues with uh, finance expert Alex Cook and uh, no topic off limits. So whether it's uh, like a topic just recently where we were talking about um, cryptocurrency, I mean, people are very excited about uh, things that are happening with Bitcoin. But I Mm -hmm. wonder what a Christian perspective on that might be. Well, that's the sort of thing we're inviting people to call in. We have talk back line open. People can leave their questions. Uh, We'll tackle every sort of finance question, but from a Christian perspective. So uh, then I have uh, other guests like Family Voice Australia. And then I have a segment regularly each week with Christian cultural commentator Bill Muhlenberg. And uh, we're not afraid to get into anything. And anyone who knows Bill, he is uh, is fearless. And we talk about a lot of things that are a little bit like Ezekiel, the watchman on the wall. And uh, there's a lot of warnings. There's a lot of serious stuff. People sometimes criticize Bill, uh, being a little bit, you know, depressing at times. But you know what? These things are important. And can't please everybody all the time. We don't think of entertainment in Christian radio as something that's funny. I mean, you tune into every other uh, high-rating commercial radio station and you'll hear a lot of comedians on the radio mm. being funny and saying all sorts of funny things. Well, we've discovered that there's a huge audience that wants to hear the serious stuff. Like I said a little earlier, some people never even thought you could even have an opinion on all of those sorts of topics. Mm. But we have loved having those those opportunities. Then beyond those regulars, I have an hour each day, and depends on your time zone because it varies from Queensland to to southern states and whether it's daylight saving time or whether you're in Western Australia. So you have to check our, our program guide to get the exact times. But but I have this hour-long conversation, which is a rarity on any radio format because people don't think that, that listeners will stay tuned for a full hour. But I believe we have got 
tens of, of thousands of listeners. All of can stay tuned for a full hour. <laughs> they can stay tuned for a full hour. They want to stay tuned. They want to be engaged. Yeah, they don't they want do. shallow. Yeah. They don't want sugar-coated. They actually want substance. And they do want to be able to have their say. So we have talkback opportunities for people yeah. to call in, present their own, you know, in a courteous way. We will encourage courtesy. Uh, we're not prudish, though. We'll we'll listen to what people have got to say, and if they've mm. got a, crit- a critique, that's always invited too. I always say, if you might have a question, you might have a comment, you might have a critique, well, you can call in and be a part of the conversation. And that's good because I don't ever propose that I'm the expert, but I do like to have a knowledgeable and sometimes expert guest on the program. Mm. So when people are calling in and they're adjusting their thoughts and their questions and their comments to the sort of topic that we cover, we've got, between myself and the guest, some wonderful opportunity to be able to talk real substance, not just sprouting opinions, actually bringing things back to biblical foundation, actually bringing things back to where the rubber hits the road, how people can live their lives today as a Christian, recognizing that there are some Christian ethics that we can glean from the Bible and live like Christ. Yep. So how would Jesus think about this? You know, how does the Bible reflect these things? What sort of role does the historical account of how we've come to understand things as Christians, what sort of role does that have? What sort of role does, you know, if someone's a philosopher and philosophers have got lots of great stuff to say, how does their role impact on the sorts of topics and issues that we discuss? Yeah. Well, we've got an opportunity. And I think this doesn't happen too many places mm. where you've got an opportunity for Christian thought to connect faith with life in such a way as you can glean wonderful principles because you're listening into a conversation. You can tune in and you can be a fly on the wall and you can listen into the conversation and you can be challenged by that. But you've also got this opportunity to be able to challenge those things if you want to pick up your phone and be a part of a talkback conversation. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I, uh, I encourage everybody to tune in and uh, expose yourselves to the program content regularly um, from the 2020 program with Neil Johnson on Vision Radio. You put the uh, address on the screen right now, vision.org.au. If you're listening um, and if you're watching, you can you can see it. But uh, go there and you know maybe subscribe to the podcast if you prefer to consume content that way. Listen to it via internet if you're not within reach of. Uh, of a satellite rebroadcast uh, station in, in a town near you, uh, look up where they are broadcast from their website. Um, there's so much content. Uh, you can go to the bookstore there and, and get different things. But here's the, here's the important thing why, why this is relevant to Pelo Talk and, and The Good Source is because my goal is to help Australians become smarter, uh, more intelligent, better informed, because a better informed population is going to create better voters and that's going to create better government and that's going to create a better nation Uh, and it's really important even if you're not religiously devoted it's really important to get back to the good ideas the true ideas the just ideas which uh, made Australia great right back at the turn of the century and created uh, the foundation for what is now one of the ten oldest constitutions in the world, uh, ten in, in its current form, and and this is a really great foundation uh, that our society is is flourishing on. And there are those, if you're watching this show, who are simply opposed to Christianity, but certainly traditional Australian values, uh, and they just want to burn the whole place down. Uh, And so the very, very important thing to do is to make sure that we're getting positive, alternative uh, diversity in our media consumption. You might not agree with everything I say or anybody else says all the time, but if we allow ourselves to get a balance to our media consumption outside what the mainstream is offering us, we have the best chance of arriving at an independent, informed conclusion, whether or not we're on the same page or not. Um, And... So head to vision.org.au and tune into uh, 2020 with Neil Johnson anytime you can and and certainly uh, listen to it later if you can't listen to it live. 
Um, but Neil, I want to thank you for your long career in, in helping inform Australians, certainly with, with Vision Radio over the last decade and longer, uh, and also for your personal encouragement and support to me as I've embarked on, on a, a similar journey recently. Um, so that's precious and, and valued. So thank you very much for that. My absolute pleasure. Thank you, Dave. Well, that's it for this episode of Pello Talk. I hope you've enjoyed meeting Neil Johnson. And uh, if you're already acquainted uh, with his program and, and ministry, uh, then um, perhaps uh, you learned some things today that were new for you. Uh, as the conversation was all about him instead of his guests. Um, thank you to the Good Source supporters who are always generous and faithful and supporting uh, financially this free and unfiltered conversation to you. Uh, as with Vision Radio, these kind of ministries are not government funded, uh, not the ABC, and only sustainable through the generosity of uh, viewers, listeners, and uh, those people visiting the website and reading the articles. Um, so thank you very much for your help. If you would like to make sure that you get our content regularly, please head to the website goodsource.news and subscribe to email updates. Uh, you will get that in your inbox, hopefully once a week, um, and that way we will always be able to reach you when the inevitable deplatforming happens from uh, the giant social media corporations. Uh, but that's it for this week. Thank you for tuning in. Share it with a friend, and we will see you next week. Good night. If not now, then when will we see an end to all this faith? Oh, it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. Na, 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 na.